welcome to our first. Is this any better at all? Is this better? Okay, awesome. Um, welcome, I was mentioning. Um, uh, my name is Tony Burrow. I'm the director of the Bronfen Brenner Center for Translational Research, and it is my distinct honor today to introduce the first speaker in our talk series, Talks at 12, as part of the center that we host over the course of the year. Um, as I'm welcoming folks to the talk, I think um, we need to start with a land acknowledgement, um, which is Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Cayuga Nation. The Cayuga Nation are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Cayuga dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Cayuga people, past and present, to these lands and waters. And so with that said, I should say that it's not only my honor to introduce our first speaker, but to also introduce the first speaker of our year-long faculty cohort talk series of faculty uh, cohort that the Human, College of Human Ecology has brought on in the realm of social justice. And so what is absolutely wonderful, a tremendous opportunity is we're gonna get to hear from scholars across the college that really represent the intellectual breadth of our various departments and our units for folks who are doing research and concerned with issues relevant to social justice. Um, it's always a great thing in the Bronfen Brenner Center when we try to align intellectual interests that match college interests and those of our community partners, but it's rare that we can do so so thoroughly with in-house folks. So over the course of the year, you're gonna to get to hear from faculty colleagues that are here on campus and in this college, and it's a real treat. So please return over the course of the year to hear from all of our uh, faculty scholars as part of the coastal, uh, social justice uh, cohort. Without further ado, um, it's time that I should introduce our first speaker, Dr. Laura Bellows. Um, Dr. Bellows is an associate professor in the Division of Nutritional Sciences. In 2021, she joined the faculty at Cornell after spending 20 years at Colorado State University, go Rams. Uh, Dr. Bellows' research is focused on the development of eating habits and physical activity patterns in early childhood, interventions in the early care setting, and influence of parental behaviors in the home and on the development excuse me, of these behaviors. Much of her work is focused on health disparate populations, including those with limited resources who are Latino and living in rural communities. Additionally, Dr. Bellows has worked with an interdisciplinary food systems team contributing expertise in diet quality, food security, and the food environment in rural communities. Her work has received funding from USDA, NIH, and a number of community foundations. In 2011, Dr. Bellows was awarded the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and engineers presented by Barack Obama. <laughs> That's very cool. Did, did you mean, uh, it was very cool. It sounds very, very cool. Um, in 2019, she received the Society of Nutritional Nutrition Education and Behavior Mid Career Award. She serves as an associate editor for the International Journal of Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity and co chair of the research division for the Society of Nutrition Education and Behavior. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Bellows. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation uh, to be here today. It's certainly a privilege to be with the Broffin Brenner Center for Translational Research. Um, I also want to just acknowledge Sarah and Elizabeth for your assistance um, in getting us up to this, this day. So I'm going to talk to you today about the work we've done related to family meals, particularly with families living in rural communities that um, have limited resources uh, and how attaining that meal, uh, the ideal meal, matches or does not match with the realities of our busy lifestyles today. So just a roadmap, I, I do also just want to give a brief background to get, set some context of my own work and how the, what I'll be talking about today fits into that. A little bit of um, background on family meal times and what the importance is and how um, we have navigated our meal times and view those meal times in light of our, our society and our HERO study, which is the healthy environment study. And we did a very relatively robust formative research phase that led into our intervention uh, to address family meals. So my work in the health behaviors lab, as Tony mentioned in my intro, 
encompasses both the development of healthy eating habits and, as well as physical activity, but in a community uh, environment. And a lot of my work has been done in Head Start. Um, and a lot has been based in the child care center. In this grant, we actually expanded outside of the center and looked at the home environment, but really wanted to understand the context of what is going on in our families and used an uh, eco-cultural framework. So as I talk about Head Start and eco-cultural frameworks and um, so forth, you know, certainly I need to acknowledge the work that Yuri Broffenbrenner, it's been so foundational to the work that I've done and I hope you'll be able to see those themes throughout the talk today. The other umbrella to set up is the childhood obesity uh, framework in the sense of this is where most of my work has been done to address obesity in early childhood, so two to five-year-olds, and it's a growing uh, epidemic. And while this, these data show the obesity, we also have high prevalence of overweight in this age group. And we know that children in early childhood are overweight or obese. It, it tracks through uh, childhood and into adulthood. I give you data also, New York has one of the higher childhood obesity rates, certainly up north of the Mason-Dixon line. And I also give you Colorado data because it's the context in which I'll be talking about today. We also have to recognize that these rates are almost double in low-income and ethnic minority children. So certainly looking at this uh, obesity epidemic from a social justice lens is, is warranted. So what are kids eating? Our diets in, are not very good. Um, they start out pretty good. So young kids start well, and then it goes down and it, it comes back up. But nine out of 10 children are not meeting vegetable recommendations. And while they do better with fruit consumption, it still remains relatively low. So we have lots of room for improvement. And family meal times are one avenue or event that we can make inroads into improving healthy eating. It provides an opportunity to model healthy eating practices, but also there's a social context to our family meals. It's not just about food and nutrients, but it provides an opportunity for family members to check in with each other, plan activities, monitor the mood and emotions. So there's a lot that goes into the family meal time beyond just food. However, related to meals and diet, uh, we see that families who eat three or more meals together have uh, reductions in the odds of being overweight or having disordered eating, as well as the decrease in the odds of offering unhealthy foods. Likewise, uh, or conversely, we see an increase in the odds of serving healthy foods if they eat three or more meals a day together. Families who regularly eat together have children who do better in school. They have are of more average or normal weight status, less likely to um, participate in at-risk behaviors such as drug and alcohol, and consume more fruits and vegetables. And this is a collection of work. Two of the primary researchers, uh, Barbara Fees and Diane Newmark Steiner, have done a lot of work primarily on older kids, school age and uh, adolescents, but also in middle income and populations with a high, higher white populations. So we're missing some information related to uh, family meal times. We know that family meal times provide routine, which is important for kids to have some consistency in their, their days. It's an opportunity for planning, uh, shopping, meal preparation, as well as um, having some consistency to the times of the day. It becomes predictable for children to know when they're getting fed. There's a level of emotional connectedness among family members, and it becomes an effective strategy of communication in um, the interconnectedness among family members. So lots of positive aspects to family routines. What do they currently look like in the US? Um, they're typically about 18 to 20 minutes in length, and that is for school age and adolescents. There's one study um, in a review of two to five-year-olds, and it lasted anywhere from two to 47, which says they gave up after two minutes, and the 47 is the really slow eater that, for those of us who have children, we have gone through that painstaking um, dinner where they are taking forever to eat. 50% of families eat together three to five times a week. 
uh, with school age kids being slightly higher and as they age, it decreases likely due to school events. And so the challenges to attaining regular family meal times relate to time um, constraints due to child schedules, but also work. And our work environment has changed over the years where we have more and more families have dual career earners, shift work where we have, because of the cost of childcare, parents are staggering when they work. And so there isn't an enjoyment of, of having um, the nine to five lifestyle that I think our culture has built, been built around. We have seen changes in eating patterns. We have increased snacking. So we do not just eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner anymore. We are now filling the time with snacks and we are increasing our food away from home. Takeout restaurant meals are becoming um, more ubiquitous with our daily lives. Challenges also relate to, we, the research will suggest that those who can plan their shopping and meal preparation um, are stick to family mealtime routines better than those who have lower planning abilities and cooking skills comes into play. Um, certainly with how we're able to prepare our meals and so forth. So lots of challenges that come into play. We see demographic differences related to these challenges. So family meals are less common with families of limited resources. And I'll talk a little bit more likely due to some increase in chaos and stress that relates to um, a decrease in, in family meals. There are rural urban differences in the food environment and the accessibility and availability of healthful foods or any foods makes family meal routines a little challenging. There's a desire for cultural norms and cultural heritage to be incorporated into family meals. And for those that are coming from different cultures, um, wanting to use family meals as an opportunity to carry on their culture with their children. We have conditions with, um, that impact our, our meals related to food insecurity. We know that families that are food insecure are less likely to have fam uh, routine meals and there's uh, obesity. Those who are, are obese have a different looking meal, at least as the research is em emerging there. And I'll get into those in just a minute. And then the age and developmental stage differs. And so we have set ideals around what mealtime looks like, but the, the ideals I just presented a bit are, are for those school aged and older kids. And it doesn't the ideal having a preschooler, to me, the word chaos encompasses what it's like to try to eat with a preschooler. Um, and so we have to have different expectations related to the age and developmental stage. So chaos is something we see often in families with limited resources, and it's the lack of routine, it's um, decreased structure in their everyday events. Um, things come and go uh, and so forth. And what we see is that family chaos with a lack of mealtime planning is associated with food insecurity. Meals in food insecure households, they vary in the frequency, location, and the quality of the foods that are served. And that households with chaos are influenced, uh, the frequency and location also have an impact on the inner uh, relation, interactions in the household. And those are likely due to those challenges I mentioned before related to time constraints or conflicts with work and school, food shortages, as well as just that overall stress of poverty and food insecurity. So um, these all can encompass and have impact on food security. Related to meal times and childhood obesity, we know that quality of the meal differs based on the weight status of the children at the meal. Um, there's, ten, there's, there's studies suggest that there's a, a decrease in emotional connectedness um, with obese children having a lower connectedness. There's a difference in the foods that are served and the number of adults that are sitting at the, at the table. Mealtime parenting styles, those with obesity tend to be more authoritative in nature and uh, exhibit behavior such as restriction and controlling of different foods. So the data I presented is based on this kind of um, leave it to beaver mentality, right? That's what we have kind of been brought up, many of us, in based on our media and cultural exposures to think this is the ideal 
two parents, mom's at home cooking dinner all day. Dad comes home at six o'clock every day. We sit down with cloth linens and nice dishes and we sit at a table and we have wonderful conversation. Everyone gets along great. You know, the sun shining, the rainbow and unicorns are out. It's beautiful. We know that's not reality, but we still strive as that is our ideal. So the question my colleagues and I started to ask was, do people really want the Norman Rockwell, the Leave it to Beaver? Is that still the ideal or has the ideal shifted? And if it's shifted, what is the new ideal? How do we create an ideal that also takes into account that we are eating out more often, that the dinner table is not the only place we eat our meals together and more and more people are eating their dinners in cars. So is it where you eat? Or is it that you're together? Or what is it about the family meal that is people want to strive for? And so as we were you know, starting to develop an intervention, we're like, well, we can't say what we want is what people in rural Colorado want. Um, how are we going to understand what it is that people are striving to do? So, our, where we came to is we need to understand the realities of family meal times with our rural counterparts who are raising preschoolers. And that was our kind of narrow focus. We needed to understand work schedules. We needed to understand the chaotic households that they, they live in. And you know, chaos is an interesting concept because what I perceive as chaotic, you might perceive as normal. And so just because we score high on a chaos scale does not mean it's impacting us the same way. What's our perception? And then how does food insecurity and this obesity paradox come into play? The rural availability and accessibility, where are they getting their food? What, are the, what, is, what is feasible for them to do? If we're talking about planning meals, well, how often are they going shopping? Where are they getting? Are they getting it from a grocery store or a corner market? What are the values and norms? Um, they, they, you know, we, we talk about values and norms generationally, culturally, but also geographically, there are, there are cultural norms and values. And then preschoolers, um, they're near and dear to my heart, um, but this is what we hear from parents. This is their reality. They've got tears at the table. Well, here's what's going on. In preschoolers are increasing in their autonomy and they use food because it's the one thing that they can manipulate. They have food preferences that they're beginning to exert. So they're selective eaters. They're refusing foods they used to eat. They're basically picky eaters and they're driving parents nuts with, well, they ate it one day, but they won't eat it now. And those developmental changes are having an impact on the nutritional quality. And overarchingly and overwhelmingly, when we talk to parents, it's like, I just wanna see them eat a vegetable. They would just put one carrot in their mouth, I'm good. But you take this all into the context of what's going on, and that's how we're trying to build an intervention um, for this age group. So our HERO study is a USDA funded, and it was to build an inter a family intervention for Head Start families um, that focused on healthy eating and activity. And as I mentioned, we've used an eco-cultural theory that really is trying to understand that context of the family environment. So just to orient you to Colorado, I refer to Colorado um, as Neapolitan ice cream, because when people think of Colorado, they think of snow-capped mountains and the beauty of Colorado. And that is what you get in this white area. So the middle section, the vanilla section is our um, economic engine to the state. It is where Denver is and our, what we call the front range. And it also is where all the ski resorts are. So it's our tourism, our economy is based on tourism. In the strawberry flavored Western Slope, that is a combination of tourism as well as agriculture, but on a much smaller scale. And to the right in the chocolate section, that is our, the Eastern Plains, which is a lot like what you think Kansas is. It is flat and fields. And that is our ag, um, our ag economy. So rural isn't all rural. 
And we have folks that are low income living in the mountains by choice because they want to live in the mountains, but they are highly educated and they've chosen to work at a coffee shop. It's a different mentality than the farm worker, shift worker, prison worker that's living out in the Eastern Plains. So we decided because of obesity rates and other demographic uh, characters to look at the Northeast uh, portion of Colorado. We did a very relatively robust formative phase where we really wanted to understand what is going on with these families related to diet and, and physical activity. The two pieces I'm gonna talk about today are the food behaviors and the environments in the home environment, as well as daily life. So we did a mixed methods approach and we did eco-cultural family interviews where we went out to people's homes for about 90 minutes and um, we assessed what was going on, what's your daily life from when your child gets up to when your child goes to bed. Um, and then what do you do before and after? Because it's amazing what parents can pack in uh, when their child is sleeping. And then we focus both on activity, but, but really on meal times and how, what do their meal times look like? And what do they perceive that is good about those meal times? What would they like to change about those meal times? We then did with a different sample of about 30, we did uh, food photography where we gave these families uh, an iPad and asked them to take pictures of the mother's uh, dinner and the child's dinner, both pre, um, pre-dinner and post-consumption. And we were wanting to understand not just what their child was eating, but the context in, in how they were, they were eating. And we also looked at it from a feasibility perspective of could these families um, use the technology and give us data in real time. After those seven days, they, they returned the iPads and we did focus groups with them. And we, because they had just taken pictures for seven days of their meal time, they were primed to be giving us some input about um, what their ideals were and what their realities were related to family meal times. So these three pieces, I'm going to give you the information. I've synthesized these to, to share with you about um, we're doing. I'm going to give you the end of the story first um, and then build up to this. So this is a quote that I think sums up everything we heard. Growing up, we always sat together at the dinner table and we always ate together. That is something that has been really hard for me as a mom to do since there are a lot of different people. They are being picked up by the babysitter. Then my husband gets home late. I'm hungry. I have to eat. I can't wait for him until eight o'clock. But I think that is one of the things that's very important to me, but we haven't been able to follow through because of the crazy schedules. So there's a desire, but there's the challenges based on those time constraints. Overall, there's a strong desire for family members to eat at the same food, eat the same food at the same time at the same place. I think when there's good conversation and food that's actually being eaten and the children aren't fighting, then that's a good dinner time. So their concepts of ideal come together, family togetherness. They really wanted that social connection. Children liking and eating the prepared foods and also telling mom that they liked them and thank her was a big piece too. The healthfulness of the food and a non-chaotic mealtime. Challenges, work schedules, picky eating. They won't eat what I serve them. I can't get them to eat anything. I'm tired of eating the same three meals that I serve because I serve them because I know they'll eat them. Disruptive behavior and negative role modeling by other family members. So when we did our food photography, we wanted to know, okay, what are they eating from a nutritional quality perspective? And then what are these other contexts? Are they eating the same foods? Are they eating at the same time? Uh, are they cooking and preparing the foods? What's that level of preparation? And then some other context that'll, that'll come out here. So I know this um, is a big graph. I just wanna point out the con consumption and then what the daily recommendations are. So if you think about dinner, it should be about one thirds of your daily intake, right? Cause it's breakfast, lunch, there's some snacks in there, but dinner is usually the big meal that gets at least one third. Protein levels, they should be eating 19 grams. They're eating close to 17. So they're getting most of their protein at dinner. That is in line with all of our day Americans eat a lot of protein. 
fiber is really low. Um, they're only eating 2.5 grams of about the 17 to 19 uh, gram recommendation, which means they're eating a lot of enriched greens and there's no whole grains in their diet. Fat, they should be getting 25 to 35% of their calories from fat. They're getting close to 40%. So their meals are very high in fat. And calcium, 800 milligrams, and they're only getting about 157 milligrams. So those are some of the big discrepancies from a nutritional perspective. We go, okay, diet's not great, but what does this mean? And this is the beauty of food photography. So before I get into that, um, we looked at the timestamp of the photos and, you know, there's a perception and we hear this with, and it, we hear it more with middle and upper income families anecdotally that they're eating, there's two meals. There's the kid's meal that we make for them at six. And I wait for my husband and the kids to go to bed and my husband and I eat a different meal like salmon or something. I know my kids won't eat and we'll eat that at eight o'clock. Uh, or we just make two meals and eat together, but they're different foods because I want to give my kids something I know they'll eat, but I don't want to eat chicken nuggets all the time. So we found in these families that the majority of them are eating at the same time and they are relatively eating the same food and we controlled for differences in condiments and things like that. So from an intervention perspective, we said, okay, what we're thinking of doing is feasible because they're eating, they're, they're having family meals. We want to know the quality of the food. So this is an index score that mimics the healthy eating index. And the healthy eating index looks at adherence to the dietary guidelines. So the healthy meal index just looked at the adequacy. Are they meeting the recommendations for fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and so forth? And the score is a 30 out of 65. Not great. And so this is what food photography does for you. It tells you what this really means. So the range of the scores an average over the three days was between 13 and 41 out of 65. They had um, a couple of kids had zeros because they ate French fries for dinner. Our mean looks like the middle photo, which is baked beans, some chicken and rice, but no vegetable. And our highest was a 55 and that had multiple vegetables. It was a stir fry with some chicken, rice, a tortilla, and then it had a, a fruit smoothie uh, as a drink. So you can see the spectrum of foods that the kids are being served. And that's what food photography is. It brings these numbers to, to life a little bit. When it comes to food preparation, what are they doing? So we adapted a scale and we looked at a zero for takeout or restaurant foods with three, which was scratch cooking. And we saw quite a bit of takeout. And then these are, so you see the, the hamburger, the convenience and ready to eat is your chicken nuggets and French fries. Semi-convenience is spaghetti with some sauce. And the non-convenience is again, chicken, rice, beans, something that was scratch cooked. Our mean is that orange bar which is about 1.7, which is a combination between convenience and semi-convenience. And what we know about that is they are most likely processed and ultra-processed foods, which are gonna be high in fat, high in sugar, high in sodium. So from a nutritional quality perspective, not great. The ideal. So parents told us, here's my ideal. I want them to eat some, I want them to eat balanced and healthy, and then I want them to eat everything that's on their plate. So the ideal, we have, they have to at least have one healthy thing. I wanna see them eating something balanced, not too much sugar. They should always have a, a vegetable and we should stay away from processed. Here's the reality. Single food foods, highly processed, high in fat, high in sugar. So they want something, but the foods are not matching up to what they have. They want their kids to finish everything they put on their plate. I just want her to eat, period. You have to at least eat half of it. Sometimes we see that she needs to eat, but she won't do it. I'll tell her if you're still hungry, I'll reheat your food for you and can finish your supper later. So you're still gonna clean your plate. I don't care if it takes all night for you to do it. Um, so they're serving their kids really large portion sizes. And the pictures on the left are the mother's pictures and the pictures on the right correspond to what they're feeding their children and they're identical. So 
they're feeding them these huge portions and expecting a four-year-old to eat the same amount as an adult. And so they're setting their selves up for failure if their expectation is that I, a successful meal is my child's gonna eat everything. Well, there's no way a four-year-old's gonna eat adult, adult portions, right? So we, we started to say, say, okay, we've got to do something here about portion size. The way they define a, a successful meal is that their kids are well-behaved and engaged and the meal is easy and relaxed. Um, I don't know about you all, but easy and relaxed on a, a weekday meal just does, they don't, they don't go together very often. So they define that as no tears, um, it's not chaotic, and I don't have to tell my kid more than twice to sit down. Um, those of you who remember the preschool years or currently have them, kids, we call them pop-up kids, they can't sit still. They're just kind of moving all the time. This is what it really looks like. Their meal times are really chaotic, and you've got kids that are different, doing different things. One's crying, one's doing something else. Your table is cluttered. You can't really see where the food is. So unless it's something he really likes, it's a struggle. He runs around and picks and eats and runs around some more. They took three bites and then my daughter's off like, I don't like this, right? So these are the common things and the realities is that it, meal time with preschoolers is very chaotic. So collectively, our key findings is that the meal times with this sample, um, the reality does not align with their ideal. The expectations for preschool age children are unrealistic, and they're not based on the developmental stage of, of um, where they sh what should be expected of them. And that the mothers are eating the same foods at the same time as the child, therefore intervening at dinner time um, was feasible. I should also mention the reason we chose dinner time is because the kids are in Head Start and they get breakfast and lunch in Head Start. So to intervene at the home environment level really left dinner as our main focal point. So the hero's intervention had three components, the healthy eating, physical literacy, and then underscoring all of that was a mindful parenting um, component. It also included both parent workshops, child workshops, as well as um, we had some digital apps. Um, but I'm just gonna focus on our, our parent workshops and the child workshops and parent workshops were done simultaneously. <clears throat> These are our conceptual models. I'll introduce you briefly. These are the sporks um, and we have, they have personalities and they like to cook and they like to be active as a family. But our emphasis here in, in teaching parents that healthy eating, you have to teach your kids. It just does not come naturally. It takes effort like everything else. And so for the parents, we are wanting to encourage them to um, encourage, engage, model, and set expectations of what is their expectation for their children at mealtime. It's easier to set expectations at an early age than to try to do it later. In childhood, it's important to model whether you can be a positive role model or at least a neutral role model. You don't have to try every food, but can you be neutral? And can you get your partner, spouse, and older siblings to be neutral role models? How do you engage your child in conversation? Preschoolers are not very conversational at a dinner table. If you ask them a question, it's yes or no. And if they ask you a question, it's why, why, why? right? It's, it's bang your head against a wall. But yet these families want to have these engaging family meals, but it doesn't match with the developmental stage of the preschooler. So specific to mealtimes, um, from a developmental perspective, we are focusing on food neophobia or that picky eating. We talked to parents too that children are seeking attention through bad behavior, and they're using food to sometimes do that. And so Giving them attention in other areas can help alleviate some of those bad mealtime behaviors. Understanding the cognitive development of what they are capable of, as well as their motor abilities. Parents want kids to have really good manners, but kids at this age don't have the fine motor skills to, to consistently eat with a fork or a spoon, and therefore they are going to pick up food with their fingers, and you need to be okay with that talked quite a bit about temperament and understanding the temperament of your child so you can see your child as a unique person 
and not as someone who you just want them to do what you want to do. For mindful parenting, the focus was on paying attention, listening with full attention, being non-judgmental, not just of your child, but of yourself, the emotional awareness of child and self, and compassion. We are all doing our best. Mom guilt is powerful. And we were really trying to alleviate some of that mom guilt to say, we know you're doing really good and we know you're trying really hard. These are some strategies that can make it a little easier for you, but we're not judging and you're not gonna judge yourself. Um, and then focusing on the, the parent-child interaction and making that a positive parent-child interaction. So just to say we recruited 37 families they hit our uh, criteria. We had about a third who were Hispanic, two thirds were with limited resources, moderate education levels, uh, high health risk. They were uh, mostly obese and had cardiovascular disease risk and poor diets. And we know that poor diets, maternal poor diets associate with poor diets in children. So kids' diets were high in added sugar. Um, they ate a lot of fast food and they had low vegetables. And then COVID. So COVID with uh, a lot of research, we were handed a big old bucket of lemons. We made it through um, the intervention, but we were unable to go collect uh, our objective measures at post um, intervention. So we had to figure out how we we're gonna make lemonade out of these lemons. And that's where we uh, pivoted to qualitative and we did um, Zoom focus groups, uh, Noreem um, postdoc who has come to Cornell with me from Colorado State was able to do, and we did the four focus groups, one at each site, and then followed it with individual interviews. In addition to asking just about the process and feasibility of the intervention, we really wanted to explore the impact of parent-child interactions during those meal times. And so what we, our key themes that we heard from the focus groups were about focus and presence. And, and uh, parents really kind of taking that step back and giving attention to their children, non-judgmental acceptance of the child, understanding who they were as little people, um, connectedness. We had heard in our uh, interviews that our rural families had, moms in particular, had a sense of social isolation. And what they really appreciated was coming together and hearing from other moms and feeling like they weren't alone anymore. The interviews um, also reinforced this communication and empowerment they felt. They felt like they were, they were having better communications with their child when they started to see their child in the, the way that um, they were unique individuals. So for focus and presence, the full attention to the child was important. Um, this gets to, I stopped saying, yeah, 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 yeah. I stopped multitasking. I really just took the time to focus. And when you take the time and spend with your child for 10 to 15 minutes, instead of trying to multitask, then they're not going to go to mealtime and try to get your attention by doing these other behaviors because they feel like they were heard right before dinner, or they feel like they can get your attention. So that's how that relates to mealtime. I started taking better note of how I felt and was thinking of my day and how it affected my daughter and vice versa. So when I'm stressed, that comes off and that's how my daughter starts to feel the stress. When you get stressed as a parent about mealtime, the others around the table can feel that stress as well. Non-judgmental acceptance of the child. Again, seeing the child as the individual and getting the parent to be more accepting and patient by understanding those developmental stages and being less frustrated. When I have their perspective, it helps me to make better decisions. I think I can't always necessarily apply it to, di I didn't think I could apply it to dinner time, but now I can say, well, why don't you like it? Or would you like it better if there was cheese on it? So they're changing the way they're conversing with their kids and not just saying, eat it, take a bite. I was getting mad because she wasn't eating all of her food. I realized I was giving her way too much, which we saw in those photos. <clears throat> a lot of the activities were provided when he's just bouncing off the walls. I took, go tell him to grab his jump rope. It's been really helpful. 
So especially with boys who are antsy and always bopping around and all that, if they are have ants in their pants and then you say, okay, now it's dinner time, they can't sit there. So have them be active 20 minutes, half hour before dinner time, get the wiggles out so that they are ready to be sit down at a dinner time was kind of a, the way we were strategizing with parents to help them. So communication and empowerment, um, that was facilitated by being the focus and presence and really kind of looking inward and then the non-judgmental acceptance. There were opportunities to actively per participate and give full attention to their children. I was started asking a lot of questions. That was one of the things parents wanted. What do I talk about with my kids? How do I converse with them developmentally appropriately at dinner? Like I wanna to talk to them. And so we gave them suggestions of the type of questions to ask, um, how you detract and you don't ask all your questions about the food on the plate, but you know, they're gonna, they're gonna eat it. But if you focus on, you gotta eat your carrots, two more carrots, this like that, then it becomes a pressure environment versus um, communicating in that way. They now feel heard because I'm getting down on their level. He feels just better about trying new things because he feels heard. And that includes trying new foods because he has choice in it. Maybe he has decision-making and maybe the decision is, do you want carrots or green beans? That's a choice. And that's a powerful choice for a three or four-year-old. Connectedness. And this is what I mentioned with the social isolation. They really came together um, and showed a lot of social support um, with it. It made me feel like less of a failure. I'm not the only one who's struggling. You know what? If they can do it, I can do it. Um, other moms helped me realize that we're all doing our best and we just have to keep trying. This was probably one of the more powerful pieces to see, you know, from week one when they were just being introduced to week six and then they wanted to continue to dialogue after the intervention because they felt like they had, they had their peeps. They had the people who truly understood what they were challenged with on a daily basis. So to just bring this all together and conclude, um, parents of preschool, preschoolers, they value meal times, but they are challenged. And the challenges are real in rural communities. The challenges are real for uh, low-income families where work schedules, um, multiple caregivers um, all come into play. The ideal and the reality, they're still not matching up. There's quite a bit of discordance there. So as we talk and we intervene, we need to understand where their realities are and how we help them get to what their own ideal is. Mindful parenting, I think, has promised as an approach. Um, I think it trans translates in our context to mealtime, but we also heard things about bedtime and other behaviors. So I think it's um, an approach that can help them address the stress and chaos that often accompany mealtimes and other behaviors. And um, there's some future research in examining, and Lahia Reyes, a, a postdoc as well with our group, is going to be looking at alternative caregivers and their role in mealtime and, and feeding and how you know, we can all be supportive at the, the meal environment. I will also say I'm interested to now in exploring more about the environment, the physical environment. We got the social environment. One of our families talked about, well, we eat at the same time, but we have this tiny apartment. And so my son, my older son takes his food and then he goes and sits on the couch and watches TV. My young daughter, I put her at the little doll table because that's the only table we have. And then I eat at the counter. So while they're eating the same food at the same time, they don't have physical space to eat as a family. And so how do we help those families think through um, contextually how they can get their ideal family meal? So I think there's lots of work to still be done. Um, and I hope you've seen a story um, that pulls in uh, a broad ecological perspective to family meals. I do want to acknowledge we have um, have lots of collaborators. So Noreen Mena, who did quite a bit of the focus group work, Susan Johnson at the University of Colorado um, is a co-PI on this and her team, as well as Doug Coatsworth, who's our mindful parenting, who was at CSU, but is currently at the University of Tennessee. And with that, I will take any questions.
So if these mics on, the table mics work. So please, if there's any questions, reactions. Um, so we have one from the group online that I can share. Um, first, a lot of people were saying, this looks like my meal at home. <laughs> the photo <laughs> the four photos. I can totally get on board with this. Um, other people who commented that they got um, is it Guyam balance ball chairs to help with the wiggles for their kids to sit at those or a wiggle seat to help them? Um, so Pat sent a message saying, um, were there any, oops, sorry, just jumped. Were there any assessments of food photography after the intervention that would help you understand whether the intervention helped the mothers to change what foods were being offered around portion size or food quality? Yes, and we are currently analyzing that. In fact, Noreen has been analyzing that. So we are, we've applied the healthy meal index as well as we're looking, um, we're looking at what they serve. We're a list, you know, this is where COVID is screwing it up too, because the post-intervention and four month follow-up, depending on what cohort they were in, either hits right when COVID started and we all went in a lockdown or a couple months in. And it's, it, it's not real, right? I mean, if we all go back to 18 months ago, what our initial reaction to being home, like, are they having more family meals? Because what else do you do? Um, are they stressed out and eating, stress eating? You know, so it's, I'm a little hesitant to look at intervention impact because of the timing and COVID. So we're, we're looking a lot at baseline. Um, another one, it's, well, I'll, sorry, I'll open up to the room. <laughs> I don't want to just talk about that. Yeah. Um, I have a question about um, food photography method, which I'm really interested in um, because I've, you, oftentimes you see 24 hour diary calls or food diaries or food frequency questionnaires. Um, but um, I'm curious to know if there's any challenges in implementing this method of food photography or any even disadvantages. Um, what is stopping researchers from using this method? It's a great question. Um, just to repeat, in case others didn't hear, it's about food photography and kind of the challenges and benefits to, to administer administering it. So we did that in a sample. It's you can't take the human person out. And so we actually, I should have mentioned, partnered with uh, Corby Martin at Pennington, who developed the smart food intake. And when I talked about the nutrient analysis that his group did all that, we sent the photos down there and they, his team had to look and, and estimate portions and then put it into the database, just like you would a 24 hour recall, but you have an objective measure of it. So you can estimate those. That was extremely expensive. It was about $25,000 for 130 meals. So it's not scalable, which is why we did that other work that was looking at the HMI, the context. Um, we have another paper it, that we did in childcare that looked at lunches that were served to try to estimate our own portions. And so we weren't getting down to the nutrient level and the caloric level, but rather looking more you know, at the mid level of are they serving the right foods? Um, and from that making a, assumptions. I think there's more work that can be done with food photography to automate it a little better, but right now it's still gonna, it's still too costly to do on a large scale. Yeah. Another question. So maybe sort of a combo of questions put together, but um, first, um, are certain meals more predictable? That concept of predictability, I mean in timing, is it does it tend to be the case that dinners are more predictable probably it's more so than lunch but 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 then breakfast be, so is there a general knowledge about a certain meal of the day that tends to be more predictable or are there individual differences in that that for some kids it's breakfast other kids it's a good question you know i think from the dietitian's perspective the reason we do um when we do our analyses, we look for weekday versus weekend because of the variability in scheduling. And so the institutionalization of our days, meaning we go to work and school, like that pretty much sets breakfast and lunch up um, for that. And then there's a little more variability in dinner time, depending on after school activities and so forth. Um, 
I know when I was growing up, 6.30, like you needed to be home by 6.30. And, you know, that was when dinner was. I think my dinner at home is anywhere between 6 and 8.30 nowadays, depending on what the day looks like. So I think there's more variability in when dinner is offered just because it's not as structured as your school or childcare setting is. But I don't know of any specific research that looks at that. And I guess I guess the company question is, is um, predictability correlated with food quality? So are those folks who say this is more, they eat at a regular time, do those also tend to be people who eat higher quality foods? Don't know if it relates to quality, but I know that our recommendation for parents and preschoolers is to have uh, regular and consistent schedules because you're born with the ability to self-regulate and we screw that up as we get further into society and have to eat at certain times where we're not listening to our hunger and satiety cues. But in little kids, they do. And they might choose to not eat because they truly aren't hungry. But if they know that they're getting the next meal or snack or food opportunity, they're more comfortable not eating then because they know the next when the next meal is coming. So, you know, in a food secure household, I should preface that, they would get breakfast, a mid-morning snack, lunch, you know, snack, dinner, and they would know roughly when those are coming. So they would feel more comfortable skipping. Food insecure households, that, that doesn't work because they don't know potentially when that next meal is coming. When you have more of a schedule, we do know that those who have better routines do have tend to have higher nutritional quality because it's just there's more planning that goes into that. Yeah. First of all, thanks a lot for the presentation. This was very interesting, especially for the Yeah, it's a good question. And I will say that mindful eating is not uh, my area of expertise, but you bring up some valid points about the social dynamics that go on around mealtime. Um, and there, there will be, I think, some folks who would say, um, by not eating, you can internally be mindful. And then there's others who would say, by conversing and having conversation and not focusing on the food, you're also being somewhat mindful because it's, you're not, there are folks who do focus too much on the food and the nutrients. And so, you know, you start to look at the overall environment. I think where we need to look at research and it's a question our team kept asking is, is it about being together at mealtime or is it about being together as a family at some point in time during your day that you get that fulfillment and that emotional connectedness somewhere? And maybe you can't do it at mealtime because of shift work. And so I think that's an area to try to dissect 
what is it about the mealtime? And is it that you're talking? Is it that you're just in presence and you know where everyone is and you're just together? You know, I think we still have some work to do there um, and figure out, you know, we lump it all together as mealtime. Um, but I think we need to look at the components of it a little more. I'll get a few from online because there have okay. been lots coming in. Um, so quite a few around vegetables. Um, so thinking about um, specific questions around kind of what's the right serving size for toddlers in terms of vegetables and then thinking about how you get them to actually eat them. So if you're offering them, um, one person had said, you know, I'm offering it, I'm heavy on the vegetables seven days a week, but they don't choose to eat the vegetables. They kind of eat everything else. Um, and so thinking developmentally, how long does it take before kids choose vegetables or are ready to kind of eat those? Great question. Uh, so it takes eight to 12 exposures to a new food uh, before a child is willing to try it, not like it, but potentially put it in their mouth and swallow it. So the activity I always do with parents is I say, close your eyes and imagine I just put a, a plate of food in front of you. How many of you would just pick that food up and eat it right away? And usually you'll get one or two hands and then the rest of the room is no. Say, okay, how many of you would want to touch it? How many of you would want to smell it? How many of you would want to just, you know, use your senses? And that is the equivalent of being a three or a two, three, four-year-old is they have no frame of reference of what the food is you just put on the plate. But as adults, we expect them to put this new food and just pick it up and put it right in their mouth. And we need to build the familiarity. We need to make them comfortable with it. So that's a little bit of where that eight to 12 comes from. It should be served in its same format as much as possible to build that familiarity. Now you can build familiarity, um, not just by the food on the plate, but by talking about it, by looking at it at the grocery store, by growing it, um, reading a story that has a carrot in it, um, if that's the, the vegetable of choice. The other thing too, like, um, is to give vegetables when they're hungry. So we've done some studies, we did it in, in our restaurant at CSU where we gave um, carrot stick and ranch as an appetizer before the, the restaurant meal to, so that it wasn't competing with the French fries and nuggets. And so the kids would eat, they ate significantly more carrots as an appetizer. And so when kids say before dinner, I'm hungry, We'll give them a vegetable appetizer, get their vegetable in before you get to the dinner table. And um, then they're not, it's not competing with the other foods. So. Yeah, sure. Um, so another question that came in, um, is it okay to play cards or a simple game during meal times? This helps with connecting with our pre-K daughter and she also sits and is still engaged with us. Yeah, so that helps with the conversational piece. Um, so I might, um, we, we suggest more um, verbal games so they're not distracted by the card versus the fork and the actual physical piece. Um, so when we were creating the sporks um, and they all have names, you got Sally Spoon and Frankie Fork and all that. So my son, who's 12 now, but um, we sat around and we went through kind of our mental kitchen and we came up with names of every appli small appliance, every gadget, every, um, and that's just one way of like, you can play a game like that. You can play the alphabet game, like the, the games you play in the car can also be played at, at mealtime. Um, so the more the conversation can detract and is not focused on the food, sometimes can help. Um, certainly there's a fine line between encouragement and pressure too. And so, you know, being a process reward um, and just saying, you know, oh, I see you tried your carrot, not great. Good girl, you tried your carrot, right? So, you know, just acknowledging when they try it but not focusing too much on it. So the games do help you take away from that and engage them in the mealtime environment. Um, I, I would say too, I, I have heard, um, I think there may be several parents because of the title of the talk, because I had heard people, parents of preschoolers say, I'm gonna come to your talk. 
If parents have questions related to picky eating or all that, please feel free to email me. I'd be more than happy to, to answer those questions. Okay. <laughs> With that, then, we'll conclude by thanking Dr. Bellows for a fantastic talk, and thank you so much for sharing your data and research with us. This was really a wonderful, engaging conversation. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to those who joined us online. Again, remember to join us again for the next installment of our talk series and those who joined in the room as well. And I suppose in the, in the gentle chaos of leaving the room, you should pick up a bag lunch that we packed for you to take as, as you leave. I don't know what the rules and parameters are, but I believe that's great. So they can take, okay, please feel free to take a, a bag lunch as well. So thank you all kindly and we'll see you next time.